Today, there are two million descendants of French Canadian immigrants living in New England. These are our stories. Welcome to the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. Venez tous jeunes filles et garçons, je vais vous raconter l'histoire de notre immigration ici au USA, de grands aventuriers de pays étrangers. This is the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. I am Jesse Martineau. Now, this week, we are excited to be joined by Emily Noel Provo. She is the author of the adventure novel, The Blue Bottle, written in 2018, and an exciting new novel, The River is Everywhere, which I had the privilege to read, and it was terrific. I can tell you that I started and finished it in the same weekend. As once I picked it up, I just wanted to keep going. I found the the characters super, super interesting. Emily, welcome to the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Now, Emily, let's start with your story. So where did you grow up? So I grew up in uh, Massachusetts in a suburb of Boston um, called Dedham. Sure. Um, sure. And my uh, some of my father's family also was from that town, which I think is how we ended up there. My great grandmother lived there and my grandfather was born there. So but I lived in Massachusetts almost my whole life. So. I've lived in different parts of the state in Western Mass, and I've lived in Lowell, Massachusetts, for the last twenty plus years. Gotcha. Okay, so we've done a number of episodes now on on Lowell. So, did you grow up in a, a Franco American family? Obviously, Lowell is a town with a great Franco American background. Uh, I did, um, but it was a little different than than um, what most. People like I think in Northern New England or even in Lowell probably grew up with because my family was um, more upper middle class. Okay. So um, you know my experiences are, are somewhat different from a lot of peop- other people that I've met, like other Franco Americans that I've met. But but yes. Sure. And it, but was like the language, the culture, the um, you know, the traditions so, was that was that present when when you were growing up? That was present, you know. But um, I think it was just I think there was more of an because they were upper middle class. I think there was sort of less of an emphasis on the French language and um, and things like that because, especially in my grandfather's time, that wasn't cool. Yeah, <laughs> you know, oh. and yeah, and, absolutely. Um, yeah, he used to, he used to even use um, his initials rather than his name because his name was Emile. Yep, and um, he didn't want anyone to know. You know. So, yeah. yeah. So, so there was a bit, there was also an element of that, which is um, one of the reasons that I've spent many years as an adult trying to kind of provide sort of a lot of those experiences for myself and for my daughter. Sure. Now, do you have Franco American ancestry on both sides? I do. I do. Both my parents, um, my father's family, is mainly from Quebec, but I also have um, ancestors on his side or, uh, from the island of St. Pierre, south of Newfoundland, and also people who were voyagers in what is now Minnesota. Awesome. Okay, um, let's, let's start with the voyageurs then. What yeah. For those who might not know, what is a voyageur? We've, we've talked about it, but it's been a while on the show. They were technically, I suppose, employees of fur trading companies, European fur trading companies who sort of spread out across North America, um, trapping animals for fur, mainly beavers, but I think also minks and things. And a lot of them lived off the land in the wilderness. Um, so a few of my ancestors on my father's side were did that. And um, I guess, like I said, what is now Northern Minnesota when it used to be part of New France. And after France lost the Seven Years' War, which we call French and Indian War here, that's when they moved to the island of St. Pierre. So, and then eventually they ended up in Nova Scotia and eventually in Massachusetts. So now how, how did you discover all of this? A lot of research um, that my dad and I have done together, um, which is taking it's years, but it, but it's, it's, it's fun. Yeah. I, I mean, as someone who's done hours of it myself, I can't even imagine to be able to go as far back as you've gone with the specificity you have, knowing exactly where in you know Minnesota. That's impressive. Yeah, there's that's a lot of easy. death certificates and birth certificates and sure. tracing, you know, and I, I recently did one of those um those DNA swabs. Yeah, yeah, me too. 
you know, so it is, it's true. It's all like right in those same places. <laughs> That's awesome. Now you talked yeah. about the how that side of the family went to Saint Pierre. Now, for those who might, have, what is what is this island of Saint Pierre? So it's actually two islands, and actually, there's more than two. There's two large ones. Uh, the the I always pronounce the other one incorrectly. I think it begins with an M. It's like Mik Mikulon. Um, but they're know. south of they're south of Newfoundland in Canada, but they're actually still part of France. They're French. It's a French territory. Um, and it's the only thing from what I understand that France held on to after the Seven Years' War. Uh, that's all that's left. For there's there's them, two islands. There's these little islands. Have you ever been? I've not. And it's I, I really would like to go, but it's not an easy place to get to. I would imagine. imagine. You can either take a boat, <laughs> I think, from Newfoundland or you can, <laughs> you can. I think you might be able to fly there, but you have to go to Newfoundland first. It's it's. um it's I don't think it's that accessible. I mean, I think it was actually um like a fishing village. Sure. You know, it's like that was the point of, you know, why why they uh colonized it in the first place. But I I don't think even a lot of people live there now. Yeah, but come up on my DNA map. Oh yeah, I bet. No, that's super interesting. Now, do you know why your family on that side came to the States? Um, well, they I think mainly because of economic opportunities. I think there just wasn't um, either in Quebec or uh, Nova Scotia or St. Pierre, um, there just wasn't a lot going on. And this was in the mid to late 19th century when, gotcha. you know, during like like with many people during the Industrial sure. Revolution. So, yeah, I mean, it was just seemed like it, it's cool because that's not a, the typical story. We get normally the, the people coming down from Quebec at that time and you have the whole, you know, stereotypical farm to mill kind of yeah, process. I mean, we, I mean, we also had that, except like I said, my, my family isn't complete, very, also very typical because my great grandfather who did come to, uh, from Quebec came to Lowell actually to open a barber shop. <laughs> That's cool. He, he was a barber. He came here to open a barber shop to cater to the people who were working in the mills. I bet. I mean, and the fact that he was a French speaker probably helps quite a bit. I would imagine. And you know, to this, and, and to this day, my father claims that's why my family, at least on his side, was upper middle class because he had his own business and he kind of passed that down. That's awesome. So that is so, very cool. Yeah. Now, how about your mom's side? So my mom was actually from Michigan. Gotcha. She grew up, okay. She grew up in Detroit. Uh, my grandfather, her father. Um, is a his his mother was a Métis, and in, uh, in what are Métis for the, again something we have um, talked about just not in a while here. Yeah, so they are um, Native Americans who are kind of um, were converted to Catholicism by French missionaries um, a long time ago. I mean, I don't know a lot about the, the like the length of time. Sure, but his mom, my great grandmother, was a member of that ethnic group. And they're mainly in Canada, but there's also populations in the northern and northern Midwest, upper Midwest. So, um, very cool. Have you been able to connect with any of them? No, you know his it, my his side of my family is um, been a, much harder to to trace. Gotcha. Um, there is isn't a lot of information out there. So my my mom's side in general has been been more difficult because I I think her family. Um, wasn't quite as upper middle class you know they were more working class people there just wasn't sure. a lot of records um and uh so so that's been tough i mean i think that whole honestly i think that story is incredibly fascinating because in a lot of ways it is very you know typical of a lot of people we've talked to before with the you know immigration for economic reasons moving into lowell but how first of all how your family got there is very very different than most yeah. and the experience once they got there again is very very different than most of what we talked to it is very different and i think like i said that's one of the reasons why i feel like in some ways i've kind of missed out on a lot of the cultural experiences that other people i know other franco-americans i know have had because it was a lot of that was really downplayed to sort of blend in sure do you speak any yeah. french at all um, not well. I can sort of understand when people say things to me. My grandparents, sure. my grandparents spoke it and my great, great, my great grandmother also. My parents did not, which is also, I think, pretty typical. Yeah. Same as me. Both of my parents, first language and never taught me and my sister. Yeah. Oh Probably. yeah. That's very typical actually to not even want you to know. I have a, I have a friend whose parents sent him to Catholic schools 
that weren't French because they didn't even want them to get that close to to learning it or to even hear it, you know. So there's just sad moment. for sure. Yeah. But before we get to talk about the new novel, which I would obviously, I'd like to talk about the first work, The Blue Bottle. So before we get actually talking about the book itself, what made you want to write it? So that story, um, it's a it's a story for kids. So maybe like age eight to 14. It's a novel. And it was a story I, I wrote for my daughter. I have a daughter, um, Madeline, who's she's going to be 25 this year. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, she's a great kid. I just it just it's just weird to think that she's actually an adult person. Um, but I but it was a story I wrote for her and um it existed for many years before the book was a thing, before the book came into being. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't think that book is as well known or, or has done as well as I would like, just because it is geared toward kids. And it's really, it's a really hard group to market to, because you're really marketing sure. to parents. It's the whole world of media marketing is, is, is odd, but I, but I have, um, yeah, I've, I've gotten a lot of good feedback on it, and I, I like it. It's a great now, book. Yeah, you said you, you have a 25-year-old daughter. Now, is your daughter at all interested in any of the Franco-American past history? Yeah, very much so, actually. She's really? very, very interested in it and has, um, along with me, too, has helped me do research and, and uh, you know, things about our family. And she's, you know, she speaks French much better than I do. All right. Now... First of all, one thing I was before we move on from the from the the blue bottle, I, you you noted that it was geared towards kids, and some of the reviews I read it talked about how scary the book was. What yeah. made you want to write a scary book? You know, I think kids like stuff like that. You know, like that. You know, if you if kids feel like you're dumbing something down or like making it like you know quote unquote for kids, they just they're not interested in it. You know, if that's not that's not what they want. So. <laughs> That's awesome. I tried, I tried to make it scary without being, you know, nightmare inducing, but although it could be, I don't sure. <laughs> nobody told me that, but it, it's possible. That's awesome. So, all right. So then let's talk about the river is everywhere. So what made you want to write a second book? So I started writing that book uh, several years ago. I, I, it, it's based on, a, it, the story was based on a lot of different things Part of it is the the main character is based on my daughter's. He doesn't know this, but my daughter's high school boyfriend gotcha. was sort of a and who's a Franco American um, and lived in Lowell. It was kind of the I don't want to say it's it, it's about him, but he was kind of the inspiration for the character. And um, you know, a couple of people have asked me, you know, how did you get the teenage boy to seem so real? You know, because I'm a woman and I'm that, obviously that was going to be question number two, and, absolutely um, because it was he was initially based on an actual person of that age that age group so but um you know a lot of it too is is just based on people i've met and families i've known and i i wanted to try to come in of age story and i thought doing it through the lens of franco-american culture would be a great way to do it um and it's ultimately one of the reasons the book got published believe it or not because the publisher was so they'd never even heard of Franco-Americans or people coming from Quebec or, you know, and they were so fascinated by it. They just, they, they, that was one of the reasons they wanted to sign it. So. That is very cool. Now, so did you want to just give a broad overview of kind of what this plot is? So it's a coming of age story, um, 16 year old boy who lives in a fictional version of Lowell, Massachusetts. Um, and he basically you know, gets an argument with his parents, like, uh, you know, which is in that, in his case, to do with religion. But I mean, kids that age getting all kinds of arguments with their parents about all kinds of things. Sure. Um, and he runs away from home with the intention of returning shortly thereafter, except um, he just, as soon as he leaves, he just starts meeting with challenge after challenge after challenge and eventually gets himself stuck in a situation where he doesn't know if he's ever going to be able to come back. And and I think the the real thing of that story is relationships with people and families and what the real nature is of loyalty and loving you know loving one another and you know in the end you know who really saves whom you know who you know that's awesome 
you know, and, 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 you know, your relationships, I guess I wanted to talk about how people's relationships just go more, much deeper and much farther and are much more uh, influential on their lives than people realize, especially for kids that age, but for everyone. Yeah, no, no, no. This is really, really interesting. And one thing that I found incredibly impressive and we, we just touched about a little bit before was the way you were able to kind of analyze these challenges through the viewpoint of a 16 year old high school student, high school boy, who's now coming across things for the first time and kind of what his thought process and approach would be going into these, which I thought was really, really crazy. Yeah. I mean, I, I honestly don't, I, I think I may, I don't know if it was luck or just cause it was as I based it. I mean, I was a teenager once too, even though I'm not a boy. So I mean, there's sure. that <laughs> yeah. aspect. Um, but I think, you know, I just wanted to make him seem as human as possible. You know, no. and, he's, and you know, Terrific. he's a good person, but he's, you know, not perfect. He makes a lot of mistakes and tries sure. to learn from them. Doesn't always. <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah find, <laughs> finds himself in some very, very difficult situations. Um, m- much, much of it of his, of his causing, actually, at some points. At some but... point, right? <laughs> and, you know, and I think it also speaks a lot to human nature. You know, like some. Some people just are not good people. And, you know, how do you deal with that? And how do you learn how to deal with that? Especially when you're stuck in the middle of a situation that you have no control over. So. Sure. Now, I wanted to talk about a couple of the critical praise this book has received because it comes from a couple of names that would be very familiar to the listeners of this podcast. Yeah. So first, David Vermette, obviously we've had on the show a few times, the author of the amazing book, A Distinct Alien Race, The Untold Story of Frank Americans. He called your protagonist a Franco-American Holden Caulfield. Now, what did you think of that comparison? I thought that was awesome. I actually sent him an email after he, <laughs> after, he <laughs> after he was kind enough. He spent and and, and he's a very busy person. Oh, he for spent sure. An entire weekend reading the manuscript, the uncorrected proof, which you know, still had errors in it, <laughs> to, to to give me that quote. So I mean, I was so so grateful. And um, but I I I think he is a Franco American Holden Caulfield. You know, and, and and rather than being a rich kid, like David said, he's just a regular kid. And I think that that's one of the reasons why he's relatable. Yeah. V- regular, incredibly smart kid. Yep. But again, facing some tough times for sure. Um, and the second familiar name is Paul Marion, which is obviously the great poet, Jack Kerouac, expert from Lowell. And in his in his praise, he noted that the he was heartened by the fact that the decision that the story was set in the Franco-American cultural experience. Now you talked about the fact that you, okay, you, you kind of wanted to explore that more, you know, potentially because of kind of how you grew up. Um, how did you go about, you know, that research part? Like, how did you go about making sure that you set this person in that Franco-American world? A lot of it um, because I do live in Lowell. I'm fortunate to know, have been fortunate to know in the time I lived here, many, you know, Franco-American people and their families. And so um, I had kind of a firsthand personal look at, you know, experiences with um, people who were Franco-Americans who were not like my family was. Sure. You know, and I think that that was extremely helpful. Um, And Paul Marion himself um, was very helpful to me. I've known him for a long time and um, I was the editor of a local magazine for many years. Actually, cool. exactly. And, um, you know, he wrote for the magazine and, you know, we wrote articles about things he had done. And, you know, so um, I had the privilege of, of knowing him too. And so he was very helpful in sort of, you know, he read the early draft before I sent, you know, before it was even edited, you know, many years ago and gave me a lot of uh, feedback and, and things like that. So, you know, I, there were a lot of people helping me with with some of it. That's awesome. So a couple of specific things that I was kind of taking notes when I got to a couple of things that made me smile as I was reading through the through the experiences of this character. Um, one is obviously there's a discussion of Tortier in Raisin Pie. And I've spoken quite a bit about Tortier. Big fan of Tortier. Raisin Pie was new to me. What what is raisin pie about? I was not familiar it's with this. Exactly one. what it's. <laughs> yeah, because this is not, not something I've come across before. Yeah, it's exactly what it sounds like. Mm-hmm. And if you don't like raisins, you'll <laughs> you'll know. 
No. But I really think it came out of um, just people not having any money. You know, is that it's... typical to a a region? Or because I honestly, I I'm, I'm not very familiar. Probably with it. to Acadia. Gotcha. Yeah, right. than it is to a lot of people in Quebec. But um, I think the 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 part of that book that you're referring to is in yep. Acadia. He's in New Brunswick. So right. You know, I think, but. But I think there's also a lot of crossover between the two places. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And and why, I guess, maybe that's a, a transition for this one then. Uh, why New Brunswick? Because obviously you've you've come across, there's a there's a, a gentleman, that, a main character with a Franco-American background. He comes across another, you know, Franco-American on his journey. Why not Quebec? What made you want to do it in New Brunswick? You know, I, I that's a good question. I'm not entirely sure other than the fact that I wanted to, a setting where it would be okay I felt okay to just like sort of um make stuff up uh, sure <laughs> to, to create a setting in a real place and I and I, I I think I felt like I was too familiar with Quebec to do that well gotcha you know what I mean I wanted I wanted I mean there are some things I mean it's a real town that he, yeah. you know, that he goes to. And there are some things in the town that are real that I put in the book, but um, I wanted enough, I wanted enough leeway to kind of make it fiction. And I think I know um, too much about Quebec to, 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 uh, to maybe I avoid putting details in and things that might've tripped it off. I don't know. It's, it's a, <laughs> No, it, it's just interesting for me because yeah. when I when I was reading it, um, when I came across that character, I just flat assumed made the quick assumption that he must be from rural Quebec somewhere. It didn't never didn't occur to me that this journey would take us uh, to New Brunswick. So. You know, and I also in in terms of him it, of that character of Roland, I, I actually thought it, it might to me it made it to me it made him seem like a little more exotic. Like <laughs> <laughs> sure. Like it's, you know, ooh, New Brunswick, you know, but I mean, I just really <laughs> thought, you know, maybe it might, and, and different in a way too than Ernest. Gotcha. You know, similar, but different. Now, have you been to this town? I have not. I've been to New Brunswick, but I have not yeah. been to that town. And I'm afraid to go, like, if anybody there <laughs> yeah. reads the book and they'll be like, what are you doing? But uh, how did you pick it then? Um, On a map. I actually, I, okay. I actually had a map because the way that I wanted the story to go, I thought, well, it can't be too far from the border and it can't be too far from Quebec. And, and it, you know, I checked out what the population was and it just seemed like, yep, that could work. So that's what, and it, you know, and it, and it does, I think. No, that's awesome. Uh, one thing that came up in this book is the family blessing on New Year's day, which has come up in this podcast, just not a whole lot. How are you even familiar with this? How did you come across this tra kind of tradition? It's an old tradition. My parents, you know? my mom's family used to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And my, mine did too. My father. Oh, really? Did. Yeah. Oh, very cool. All right. Um, but not, you know, not so much when I was a little kid, but like when my father was a little kid and his, and his um, siblings, my grandfather and my grandfather's uh, parents. Um, so, I knew about, I knew that it was a thing sure. know, and I wanted, I wanted um, the family in that book to be very traditional. So, you awesome. know, I, I wanted, that's why I, I put it in there. And, and also a lot of these things too, weren't just for my sake. I wanted people who read this book, whoever they might be to sure. know about these things. I want the, you know, I want to put it in the world, you know, cause if, if there are Franco Americans that don't know about it, then I'm sure not a lot of other people do. Yeah, no, of course. No, absolutely. Yeah. I think it is awesome that people can come across these traditions that they might not be familiar with. But even from my perspective, as somebody who is familiar with it, I didn't grow up with it either. My mom's family did. Um, but to come across something that is familiar, I think was really, really cool to help you yeah. draw the connection. Because like you had mentioned before, there's not a ton of that, especially in fiction, where you have characters who go through these type of experiences. Right. And I think part of the reason for that too, at least for that, um aspect of it the blessing um is because i think many people both in canada and and here are no longer really uh follow uh, organized religion very closely so i don't i just don't think it's as important 
um, in people's lives as it was years ago either. Sure. Um, I, I guess that's interesting then because talking about religion, because the, obviously your main character has his issues with the religion right from the very beginning, right. but he ends up in New Brunswick in this very religious right. kind of setting. And was that the kind of the intention all along that you knew you were going to play on no, that religion? It piece? was the intention all along. And I think in my mind, um, even though he sort of rebels against the religion that his parents, you know, that, that he sees his parents practice or that he, he, that he grew up with. I, I don't, I don't think I ever bought, and I don't know if the, any of the readers have, but I don't think I ever bought that he was really an atheist. He thinks he is, you know, but when it comes right down to it, he isn't. You know, and but he's just trying to figure out what that is, what he believes, and what, um, you know, what's real for him, and what has meaning for him, and what maybe is BS. Yeah, because, because some of it is, you know, obviously, you know, a lot of the stuff he sees his mother doing, you know, he thinks is crap. But like when it gets right down to the grid of things, you know, I think it it helps him. A lot of obviously his approach to religion is heavily influenced by what happened to his best friend. Yes, r- really, really early on. Yeah. So I think I think that event, um, his friend dying, I think that event um, really makes him rethink everything. You know, and that's sort of the premise of the book because um, it, I think in almost everyone's life, there's an event at some point, you, you know, death or, or something else that happens that really makes you question. Well, maybe none of this is really true. Maybe none of the stuff you've been telling me is real, you know, and um, yeah, so that's actually what starts the whole thing of him just questioning his parents' religion and, you know, whether or not God exists and whether it has any relevance to anything, you know, and I think that that's the main, one of the main themes of the book. Now, um, one more, I guess, thing I want to talk about with the family in New Brunswick um, family works at a lumber yard and involved with some, you know, making of maple syrup. And there was some pretty detailed, like kind of imagery of what those places kind of look like. Did you go to either one of those? Have you been to a lumber yard or a place where they produce I have maple been syrup? To, I have been to places where they make maple syrup. I've never done wow. it myself, but um, gotcha. I've been to a lot of places where they do both small and large. Um <laughs> And I've never been to a lumber mill. So that's completely like, I don't know <laughs> like, if like the machines that they use are real. I mean, I, I mean, I did research, sure. but you know, I just tried to make it as real as I, as I, you know, when I imagined what it would be like in my mind, that's what I tried to get across how dangerous it was and loud and dirty. Cause I'm, I imagine it's all of those things. Absolutely. St. Christopher makes a makes an early appearance, I'll say, so, in the book, right. but he kind of he's kind of so, ling- his his presence kind of lingers for a bit. Right. And I think that that, you know, when he he um, I don't know if you're familiar with the story of St. Christopher, but he's sure. a, the painter and saint of travelers. And yep. um, he became a saint because he carried the Christ child across a river. Yeah. And so in some ways I wanted to kind of connect Ernest with St. Christopher when he saves the girl from the river and, you know, sort of embarks on this journey to try to maybe make the world a better place in his mind. And that's yeah, the it, one thing that sticks with him the entire time. Is St. And, Christopher. It, yeah. and I thought it was kind of interesting too, because if, if I'm not mistaken, St. Christopher is, is he even really a saint anymore? No, And that's the other reason why. That's he why I thought it would really fit yeah. with your character. And he's also the patron saint of travelers, and I believe he might be the patron saint of New Brunswick. Gotcha. But, but I so, mean, this is a this is a Catholic saint who a former Catholic saint who right. there's a lot of confusion about, considering yep. he's not an official Catholic because we don't even know if he actually existed or not. Yeah. So Ernest kind of really identifies with this because he feels like you know he's also kind of on the fringes, and I think that Saint Christopher is a replacement for him for his for his religion and his family, like throughout the entire story. That's awesome. And what other themes did you have in this book? Then? Um, so that was the, that was kind of when I was writing it, like that was sure. kind of the main, the main, um, the main thing. It was interesting. The fact that you have this former saint around whom there's a ton of confusion. And mm-hmm. then you have this kid who himself is not really sure 
what to make of this whole his religious uh, family and his what the right. role of religion in his life. You know, I thought it was cool. Yeah, and there's also you know the whole um, you know I mean I think he really believes that that he this is why he doesn't die. You know, because there's a lot yeah, of parts for of sure. where you know he could have potentially been killed, and he and he attributes that to to wearing the medal, you know, this yeah. the Christopher medal. So, which is a belief I don't think he would have possibly even contemplated would have been possible like when he right. headed out when he left right to begin with no i don't know so. that was very very cool so like i said this is a terrific book where can we send listeners to go to get to get this book so this book um is available on you know online um, on amazon and barnes and noble and uh i believe also indie bound and some other uh um bookshop.org like some more independent sellers it's also available um from the Lowell book company which is an independent bookstore in Lowell and people who don't live near Lowell or who don't live near me can also <laughs> order who can also um order signed copies of the book from the Lowell book company cool because I, I have a relationship with her so that we've we've already I've already sold a several signed copies just through her that's awesome store so now is and she ships them so you can live anywhere and she'll ship them. And it's also available in any all, you know, globally. Okay. Globally. Yeah. We'll provide any kind of links in the notes yeah. for, the, for the podcast yeah. for sure. And definitely put it out on our social media uh, kind of leading up to the episode. Now, is there anything you are working on now before we let you go? Yes. So I'm working on three different manuscripts. Because <laughs> <laughs> work's not enough. Yeah. Which, we three. which was not on purpose. It just, it just sort of <laughs> happened that way. Um, so I'm working on uh, another um, literary fiction novel, I guess you could call it, um, w which also uh, features a Franco-American family. And um, it's currently set in Vermont, but I, I'm I'm kind of going back and forth with the idea of making it in Western Massachusetts, which is- Or Manchester, New Hampshire. Sure, whatever. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my hometown. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, <laughs> it was not far from where I am. Um, yeah. So, so I'm working on that, and then I'm working. I decided um, during the pandemic that I wanted to try uh, to write a, a a romance novel with Frank wow. characters. Okay. So, um, I've been working on that kind of on and off, and lately more on because I just want to finish it. But it's set on the Isle of Orleans, off the in the St. Lawrence River near Quebec City. It's one of my favorite places on earth. Isn't yep. it cool? Absolutely. So, yeah. So, so um, I wanted to write a romance novel for smart people. You know, okay. like that's a very romantic place. But yeah, yeah. And, and most of the most of most romance novels are unreadable. So I so I decided to write a romance <laughs> novel that I would want to read. Gotcha. So that's my <laughs> that's my current project. Um, and I'm also writing a nonfiction, working on a nonfiction manuscript um, about the White Mountains in New Hampshire because I also hike all the time. I'm not writing. All right. This has been a absolutely amazing episode. We've been talking to Emily Noel Provo, an author of the amazingly fun uh, new novel, The River is Everywhere. Emily, thank you so much for joining the thank podcast. Thank you very much. Now our fathers look at us and sigh with despair to think that everything they love we simply do not share. But the spirit never dies, our culture will survive. Each of us must choose how much to keep alive. Each of us must choose how much to keep alive. Special thanks to Josie Vashon for providing the music. You can find more about her at josievashon.com. This podcast was produced and edited by Mike Campbell. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at fclpodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at FCL Podcast for more information about the topics discussed. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this episode.